My name is Michael Lynch. I'm the director of the Humanities Institute here at the University of Connecticut. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to uh, the next in our series of fellows talks. I'd like to bring to the virtual stage uh, our speaker for today, Melanie Newport, uh, is an assistant professor of history here at UConn and affiliated faculty in American Studies and Urban and Community Studies. And her current book project, which is forthcoming with the University of Pennsylvania Press, is politics and culture in modern America. And prior to joining the UConn faculty in 2016, she taught at Temple University, a community college of Philadelphia and the Garden State Youth Correctional Facility. Newport's work has been supported by the Center of the Humanities at Temple, the, ba the Black Metropolis Research Consortium and the University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, our respondent for today, uh, I'm very happy to say is Nicole Bro. Uh, who is a fifth uh, year doctoral candidate in the Department of History. Her research interests are in early American legal and social history with an emphasis on urban governance, institutions, gender, and space. And her research has been awarded fellowships of the Massachusetts Historical Society, the New England Reg uh, Regional Fellowship Consortium, and the Huntington Library, among others. She is a Draper Dissertation Fellow at the Humanities Institute this year, and we're really glad to have her. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn uh, the virtual stage over to Melanie Newport. Melanie, take it away, please. Hi, uh, thank you, Michael, for that generous introduction. Um, I wanna share my gratitude with everyone who has pulled me through this crazy past year, um, especially my colleagues across UConn and UCHI, uh, my family, and of course, my communities on Twitter and my urban history writing group. Uh, I really appreciate you. So this image is from April 9th, 2020. Uh, that day, masked protesters marched down California Avenue in solidarity with desperate prisoners facing one of the worst concentrations of COVID spread in the United States. Prisoners wrote messages on the windows of Division 10, a maximum security building at Cook County Jail. And this one, Help, We Matter Too, written in shaving cream, became a national symbol of the struggles incarcerated people faced as sheriffs and jailers across the United States abdicated their responsibility to protect the health and safety of prisoners. Part of what makes this picture so compelling are the two black hands underneath the message, reminding us this is a message from one of America's most segregated cities. Cook County Jail has been a majority black jail since the late 1950s. And part of why I find this picture so affecting is that it shows so clearly that prisoners have a politics and that they must be heard in conversations about their well-being and rights. They insist upon it. So what I, I'm going to move through this pretty quickly, um, so buckle up. Uh, this project began with a question from my mentor, Heather Thompson. She asked me, what about jails? Um, and this book project is a political history of urban jailing in the United States from 1830s to the present, uh, mostly focused on the 1950s to the 1970s, um, looking at Cook County Jail and the Chicago House of Correction, which eventually merged to become the Cook County Department of Corrections, although commonly referred to today as Cook County Jail. Building on that initial question, um, I'm really driven to consider what does urban history look like when we bring jails into it? And what does the story of incarceration in America look like when we consider jailed people? Taken on an annual basis now, jailing is a huge enterprise, right? So when we ask what about jails, um, we need to consider right, this massive scope. Um, I'm thinking about jails as historically contingent and distinct urban political institutions that in spite of a constant, res a consistent responsibility to detain people before trial and those serving short sentences. 
what I found is that mass incarceration, which we talk about as the overrepresentation or the disproportionate representation of people of color in jail, um, as well as very large numbers of jailed people, in Chicago, this was always a feature of jailing. Uh, this is differing a bit from people who talk about mass incarceration as a kind of distinct, historically specific occurrence starting in the 1970s. Um, but seeing how local jails justified the construction and expansion of jails for Black people between the Progressive Era and the 1970s helps us to understand that jail expansion was a foregone conclusion by the time the war on drugs hits uh, in the latter part of the 20th century. In American cities, jail expansion was already the norm. Um, and this image on the right is from uh, this week, right, showing what the racial makeup of the Cook County population, uh, Cook County jail population is right now. Um, so I think this is really striking, right? Even though the jail is reducing its number of people, it still has this very dramatic uh, representation of Black prisoners. Mass incarceration reflects local political conflicts and efforts at reform. Uh, local people contested and determined the quality of mass incarceration in jails. Uh, some of these reforms did help prisoners and improve the quality of their lives uh, in jail, but many of these reforms, which abolitionists today call reformist reforms, uh, made the institutions bigger and stronger. This quality matters, um, again, as populations in some places are going down, uh, but yet the disproportionality remains the same. And it's worth saying, even if there was a more equitable distribution of, among race in jails, it wouldn't make jail good, right? Uh, there is no ideal way to jail people. Uh, and I hope that this project can convince people that we need to imagine and pursue new ways of addressing harms. Um, and hopefully we can also remember that we need to listen to prisoners as they tell us what jail is doing to them. So with regard to the 1950s, which will be the focus of my uh, talk today, um, in this chapter, I'm using media sources to show that jail reform in this unique moment in the 1950s uh, occurred as kind of a dialogue between incarcerated people and their jailers through media. Uh, and that prisoners understood clearly that reformers were telling political stories about them and what happened in jail. And prisoners sought to assert themselves as equal political stakeholders. Uh, jailers saw their participation in this conversation uh, as crucial to convincing the public to support jail reform. So as we look at this kind of larger shift in the book from a kind of benevolent paternalist reform politics to one that explicitly dehumanized people accused of crimes, uh, the reorientation of jailing toward the presumption of guilt uh, is a major shift. And this required the silencing of prisoner voices in urban politics. In the scope of the book, uh, this chapter is the most intimate look at prisoner life and really lays the foundation for the shifts in jail and prisoner politics that we'll see uh, in the civil rights movement um, and as class action suits take hold later on. Uh, one of the things that I'm very concerned about in this project is how jailers co-opt and distort ideas of prisoner rights, almost as these concepts of prisoner rights are being developed. Um, so over here on the right, these are just some books that I count as kind of my, my major influences. So this story begins with the election of Sheriff Joseph Lohman in 1954. He was a PhD dropout um, and adjunct sociologist at the University of Chicago. He was well known as a consultant on matters of police professionalization. And right before he was elected sheriff, he had been in Korea uh, directing the repatriation of Chinese prisoners of war for the United Nations. Um, he was trained in the Chicago School of Sociology that believed the city was its laboratory. Um, he did research in the area of race relations. Lohman was chosen to run for sheriff by Cook County Democratic Chair Richard J. Daley. 
Daly wanted to show people that he was not just a machine hack, but he could pick somebody who was an expert to do a political job. Um, and this kind of credibility helped Daly to get elected mayor the next year. Lohman was seen as being above politics. This is Lohman here in the dark suit on the left um, as a sociologist sheriff. And you can see from this photo where people are playing baseball, Lohman loves public relations and he has the press out to the jail all of the time. Uh, and that's kind of because he wants you to forget a little bit about the problems uh, that he has in running the jail. Uh, acting as catcher here is the warden, Jack Johnson. Lohman is elected into a patronage-based political system in which sheriffs would hire their political allies to work in the jail. This had destabilized the institution because of term limits. Every four years, the jail was run by a new sheriff um, who would often bring in a new warden and a new guard staff. The jail had eight wardens between 1949 and 1956. So there's a lot of administrative flux. Uh, and this is reflected in the frustrations of prisoners. They're having a lot of uprisings in the mid 1950s. Lohman brings in what he calls a professional nucleus to run the jail. Uh, sociology grad students from the University of Chicago. He names Hans Maddock here on the right uh, as assistant warden. Maddock had been a teenage hobo and had himself been jailed. It was during his hobo years that he met Lohman in a New Deal juvenile delinquency program. Lohman was working as a sociologist. Lohman becomes a kind of a father figure to Maddock. Maddock went to the University of Chicago. He worked for Lohman when Lohman was running the state parole board. Uh, and Maddock becomes Lohman's main policy man at the jail. And Maddock, we have to note, is a marvelous hoarder. And many of the sources from this time and really through the 70s on this project come from his incredible collection at the Chicago History Museum. So where is all this taking place? Uh, the baseball image you saw was taken uh, right here uh, on the corner of Division I, what we now call Division I. At the time, this was just all of Cook County Jail on the right. Um, you can see that the jail existed alongside this larger parcel that was the Chicago House of Correction, which was a city jail, uh, kind of a workhouse in which people would uh, usually go there for a couple of days to pay back their fines uh, for kind of municipal violations. So there were two jails operating side by side, but completely separately. Um, and notably, Division One is in the process of being torn down. Okay, so who's in this jail? Um, at this time in the mid-1950s, um, about 12% of the Cook County's population was considered non-white. Um, the city of Chicago is about 14%. Um, yet, 62% of the jail population was identified as non-white. And in the case of the jail, when they're using this uh, description, non-white, they're specifically noting that Mexican and Puerto Rican prisoners were considered white. Um, so this is a pretty dramatic proportion of people. The only racial data I have from this period um, comes from x-rays uh, conducted to try and identify people who had TB. Um, and this is how this map on the right was created. This is the only map I have with specific neighborhood level data um, of which neighborhoods were sending the most people to jail. Um, and as you can see, it looks a lot like other maps today of inequality in Chicago that show it disproportionately concentrated in the South and the West sides. It's notable because for all of the documents that Lohman and Maddox create in running the jail and that, they, that Maddox saved, um, Lohman is not trying to publicize that this is a majority Black jail. Um, partially because he's trying to advance broader reforms such as merging the city and county jail. Um, but he's well aware that the jail is harming black people, um, but that certain aspects of jail reform will be a tougher sell to 
white people, um, if black people will benefit from it, right? This is messy. He's trained in the field of race relations. He knows this. Um, and so even though he's not publicizing the disproportionality, um, he is deliberately using black newspapers and magazines to publicize certain reforms, uh, such as hiring black administrators. Why are people in jail at this time? Um, this is largely due to the criminalization of uh, people on narcotics charges. In 1951, the state of Illinois had adopted one to five year minimum sentences for narcotics. They didn't have enough prison space, so they shifted uh, many prisoners into jails. Um, these arrests mostly targeted Black people, and, and they were people also who used drugs, uh, not necessarily drug sellers. Uh, this is also a period when there is kind of a tough on crime punishment model for people 21 and younger uh, who are called juvenile delinquents. Um, and all of this has the effect of overcrowding the jail. There are 1,300 beds. At any given time, there are probably 1,600 to 2,400 people. Um, so this is a kind of a weird moment in which the jail is effectively being used at, as a prison. Um, and one of the things I show in the course of the book is that the proportion of people who are awaiting trial versus those who are sentenced will be a major driver of jail politics. These are determined in some ways by the police and by the courts, uh, which helps us to appreciate, right, jails are not and were not politically isolated institutions. Okay, so let's get into these cool sources. So the grapevine was the jail newspaper at Cook County Jail. It was not just an internal document, but it was used to publicize jail reform. Hans Maddock sent the grapevine to a mailing list of over 100 journalists, reformers, uh, social scientists, and clergymen across the country. Maddock carefully annotated his copies to note when he wrote a column or where he had intervened. Uh, the tagline, right, published by the inmates and for the inmates of the Cook County Jail was very important to him. A wider view of his work, I think it's actually believable that he was not personally censoring the paper. Um, you can see on the left some of the types of columns that they had, um, sharing internal news, news from the outside, right? Like how is the AA chapter doing? Um, what's going on with sports? What songs can you request to be played on the speakers they've installed in the radio, in the jail? you know, more kind of intimate columns where people would write in um, and a few columns that covered the administration. So even though Maddock is not censoring the paper, right? And this is kind of a common expectation of these kinds of newspapers, uh, the prisoners will check each other pretty hard. On the right, we have an example um, of when editors of The Grapevine drew criticism from fellow prisoners after they published a series of particularly complimentary issues, uh, celebrating the achievements of the administration in implementing a rehabilitation program. The editors defended this kind of editorial choice with the headline, put up or shut up, in which they addressed the complaints before they actually published them in the later pages of the newspaper. Right, and this is happening at the end of February. We can all relate that people are maybe a little touchy this time of the year. Deeper in the paper, you can see that the editors were provoked by a letter to the editor. Uh, identifying himself as a former journalist, S. Singer uh, bemoaned the shift from intelligent, constructive criticism to quote, corny jokes and maudlin love dog roll bouquets to the brass. He pushed back against the, quote, distinct country weekly flavor of the paper, uh, recounting a past issue of the paper where one lady waves ecstatic over the seafood served on Friday and wants the warden knighted for his benevolence. If she will wait until July, I'll whip a shore dinner on her. No offense, Gladys, but don't be so obsequious. Singer was particularly frustrated that trivia had replaced coverage of general inmate welfare, such as uh, criticism of the outdated library 
and coverage of such abuses as the policy of not notifying inmates when warrants are filed against them. And this is a great example of how prisoners felt that the grapevine was their political space. Um, and they questioned what it meant to cede space to the administration. It's in the letters to the editor that we see uh, the forgotten men of the jail tears. Um, and this is a way that they're describing themselves. Uh, there are letters in which people are complaining about either being denied access to rehabilitation programs or they're being denied resources that they feel entitled to. Uh, so this clipping on the right comes from a letter where a guy lays out that the jail, in his opinion, should be pro providing people who don't have money for commissary funds with tobacco, that this is a practice in other jails um, and it should be a practice at Cook County Jail. The editor pushes back and says like, you say in this letter that you're from Chicago and yet you didn't know that you need people to send you money when you're inside. Um, so there is some give and take here. The question of entitlement underpinned another series of letters to the editor from prisoners uh, on maximum security tiers who didn't have the opportunity to participate in programs. Uh, and they also signed their letters, the forgotten men. And for them, this is a kind of literal framing. They claim to be forgotten in the jail's rollout of new programming. We fellows on F4 seem to be the forgotten men. We are not allowed to go to the chapel on Tuesday to hear the speaker, yet you tell us all about it in the grapevine. Couldn't we go to night school? Try and help us. We'd like to participate in the jail activities. And in using this language of forgotten men, right, which we see uh, was also kind of a frame used by FDR in the 1930s, um, they connect themselves to a wider set of concerns about how government treats people at the bottom. Um, and interestingly, they do this at a time when New Deal liberalism, the FDR kind of held up, uh, is starting to fade as a political project in favor of a more opportunity-based liberalism. And here prisoners are kind of using both frames. So here uh, in this column, uh, we also have a prisoner kind of exhorting other prisoners to embrace this rehabilitation program. And this might have been one of the issues that touched off the conflict um, over Gladys's obsequiousness. Um, this clipping says, as far as we inmates are concerned, rehabilitation means making useful citizens of us. It means changing our attitudes so that we may live in society with other people. The rehabilitative process deals with us and therefore to be effective must begin with us as individuals, right? And they're negotiating this relationship between the individual and the collective. Uh, they're speaking as we inmates, but also kind of talking about their own individual kind of challenges. And this is really interesting because rehabilitation is not usually a function of jails at all because their usual purpose and the way this jail was designed was to hold people awaiting trial. Uh, so you don't need to rehabilitate someone presumed innocent. So they're kind of working what it means for them to be in jail. An incredible piece of this is um, a TV show created by Joseph Lohman. He's interested in applied sociology. He wants to educate the public. He wants to build his reputation politically. And so he enlists prisoners to join him on two of uh, several of his TV shows, he had like five. And these are digitized by the uh, American Archive of Public Broadcasting now. The show was, this show, Community of the Condemned, was filmed at Cook County Jail, right? And part of its opening sequence is noting that this is the story of the forgotten ones, the world in which they live. Um, over the course of 26 episodes, Lohman dealt with all kinds of managerial problems, as well as kind of overviews of how the jail affected women, uh, prisoners, families, and so on. And the prisoners, it's hard to know who they are, in part because they're masked and in part because they're being uh, identified by different names over the course of different episodes. So I like this episode, Who Runs the Prisons? Uh, because Lohman is acknowledging the, what he thinks is the naked collective power of prisoners to assert their will. He wants to understand prisoner power so that he can have a more peaceful jail. 
And I like this clip because Loman starts out asking about the effect of uh, the relationship that between guards and prisoners, and he gets this much larger answer. So I'll play this clip real quick. The effect of this kind of relationship upon the inmate attitude. He's bigger, and he becomes more. Society don't do anything for the inside of the institution, nor outside of the institution. They believe in society on the whole. All they think of is building bigger, bigger and better institutions to hold inmates. And his problem, they don't know anything about it, neither do they care to know anything about it. I like this clip because, again, Loman asked a question about guards, and he gets a question of like, all society cares about is build, building bigger and better institutions, right? They don't care anything about us as people. It's a good example of the structural critique prisoners made on other episodes as they emphasize both the marginalization they experienced before uh, and after jailing. So I wanna close with one of the few individuals that we get to know through this media. Um, and this is a guy named Tom Yenlo Wong. I'm not sure if this was his real name or not. I can't find him in genealogical sources. Um, but he was DJ of the jail radio station that Hans Maddock established. And again, this was part of the remarkable publicity to black audiences. Um, you know, at the same time, the Montgomery bus boycott is women in integrated tiers in Cook County Jail are dancing together. He was the most popular guy in the jail. His peers called him the personality kid with the golden smile, uh, who is Mr. America. Um, they acknowledged, quote, his ready wit and intelligence and assured him, you are an acknowledged player, right? So this is a really well-regarded guy. He's college educated. He speaks five languages um, and he's serving a five-year narcotic sentence. He even exchanges barbs in the grapevine with Hans Matic in French, German, and Latin. So he's an unusual prisoner. Every image of him that I've seen shows him like this, just completely immersed uh, in what he's doing. And he's really held up as the best the jail can do as far as um, rehabilitating people. The prisoners, because he's so popular, they made him the target of some jokes in the grapevine. Um, in one like racist piece, they portray him as a kind of a Chinese person with long hair and very long fingernails. And they write a fake biography of his passage from China to the United States. Um, and one of the less offensive bits says that the unlikely prisoner, King Yenlo, was a royal person committed to the walled off CCJ city whose inhabitants are so pure of heart and naive, they must be segregated from society for fear society will take advantage of them. So even in this moment when they're kind of busting on their friend, they're still affirming their forgottenness and kind of outsider status. But, and they're also using humor to um, create kind of new purposes for jailing. Uh, in this case, you know, jailing people who are too pure of heart. The conditions of Wong's release uh, show us how the jail factored into an individual's life and what being a forgotten man really meant. In 1958, Wong gets to appeal his case. He asserts that changes in sentencing law had violated his rights uh, and he was now eligible for release. And as much as he seemed to enjoy these programs that he participated in, viewing the activities uh, in jail media alongside these less visible efforts uh, that he had as a writ writer, um, we can see that his primary concern and that of his peers was getting free. It was better to be free than to be doing programs. Uh, and prisoners wanted the public to consider that they would return to society, uh, that they were part of society even in jail. And as, much, as such, uh, how they were treated in jail really mattered. So in conclusion, uh, these sources show us how prisoners use these new venues to negotiate citizenship um, and contest common knowledge about the place of jailing in their lives. Um, in documenting kind of quotidian life in the jail, 
they constructed a place for themselves within a post-war liberal state that was oriented toward their exclusion. With Lohman's help, prisoners shaped a new expectation in the 1950s that jails were obligated to expand prisoners' rights. Uh, their testimonies were so effective in, as they asserted their humanity and cultivated public sympathy that a crucial task of jail reform in later decades would be figuring out how to undermine and silence prisoner voices in the, prisoner, the political discourse about jailing. So here on the left, um, as kind of a teaser for what comes next in the book, um, we see comedian Dick Gregory uh, at the Chicago House of Correction being visited by Martin Luther King um, as we approach the kind of the apex of how prisoners were able to influence uh, the discourse about jail reform. Um, and kind of putting this next to uh, an image from last December, uh, right, that says a prisoner is putting on a jail window, I'm sick, help, um, shows the real failure of the contemporary jail uh, to meet the needs of prisoners over the course of its long history. Thanks. Thank you, Melanie, so much for this thought-provoking and important talk. In the interest of time, I will keep my comments quite brief and offer a few questions to get us started on what I expect will be a dynamic and exciting discussion. In her talk, her larger book project, and in her forward-facing work, Melanie Newport brings much needed attention to Cook County Jail into the history and present of jailing in America. Her project situates jails not as a static form of state violence, but as a historically contingent urban political institution. Her examination of the political history of urban jailing challenges our ideas about the roots of jail policies, mass incarceration of people of color, and the causes underlying the shift from paternalistic reform politics to the dehumanization of people accused of crimes. Most convincingly, Newport demonstrates the place of incarcerated people's actions and politics as a critical part of the dialogues of jail reform, rehabilitation efforts, and prisoners' rights. Today's talk detailed how incarcerated individuals used programs developed under Sheriff Joseph Lohman and his assistant warden, Hans W. Maddock, to define their conditions and needs. In our discussion, I hope that Melanie might speak a bit more in depth on the logistics of the programming. What role exactly did the different spaces of the jail play in the making of these programs? And how did it facilitate interactions between incarcerated persons and outside audiences, such as the interviewers or the press? How were individuals selected for participation? And to what degree was the content prisoner led? I would also invite you to elaborate on the role of the workings of the jail itself, particularly the role of wardens and guards. What were the challenges of executing these programs in the very real world where external factors such as corruption and violence were significant impediments? Media offered people in jail an opportunity to assert their own understandings of incarceration as distinct from the ideas of the institutions that jailed them. The voices we heard in radio, print, and television programming articulated the quotidian in powerful ways to illuminate the marginalization of these individuals, both prior to and during their incarceration. Through this platform, the incarcerated expressed the view that access to rehabilitative activities was not something to be contingent on their worthiness, but rather was essential to humane treatment and akin to a proto-right. I was struck in particular by the juxtaposition of the forgotten men and the exceptional example of Tom Yenlo Wong. Thinking about Tom's use of an assumed name, the use of masks in the community of the condemned to obscure prisoners' identities, as well as the forgotten men's use of the collective we prisoners when addressing um, the, in print, I was thinking about how these examples give us an opportunity to think about how the men simultaneously asserted an identity for prisoners as separate from their crimes and their incarceration, but also while obscuring their own. I'd be interested in hearing you speak a little bit more about the tension between the individual and the collective, as well as the tension between visibility and obscurity. And perhaps to bring things full circle to where we began, how these tensions are still visible in the image you showed us of help 
we matter too. So Melanie, I'll give you the opportunity if you'd like to respond to any of these questions and then we can open it up to the audience. Um, and as a reminder, everyone can be entering these questions at any time in the Q&A feature. Thank you. Cool, Nicole, thank you so much. Um, I'm really excited to be in conversation with one of my colleagues here in my department. Uh, Nicole is producing, I think, just one of the most exciting projects um, on the colonial origins uh, of the police. Some of your questions are really interesting and exciting to me. Um, I think, you know, there's a couple things here at work. Um, they're having, this is a jail that's built in a really rigid way. Um, so there's not a lot of common spaces. Um, during this time, they're basically converting any available common space um, into a chapel. And so they're doing, you know, what they see as rehabilitation by the prisoners creating mosaics to decorate the chapel. Um, you know, similarly, like they're trying to create a jail hospital, uh, which is really just like a, a room with some beds in it. It's not an actual hospital. Um, so this is really difficult. The jail, it, this is a, an incredibly tight space. Um, that, that's like the best way to describe it is it just feels closed in. Um, a lot of prisoner life is kind of confined to these like 20 by 30 day rooms on each floor. Um, so this is a tricky thing when they don't really have the space. Um, he's also using outdoor recreation areas uh, as a kind of safety valve to get people playing outside um, in better weather. I don't entirely know how people were chosen to be um, on the show uh, or to like run the newspaper or anything. Uh, though I think like there were certainly clearly more, you know, smart, engaged, uh, prisoners who got kind of extra privileges. Um, and I think but part of what we see in some of the debates in the grapevine are about prisoners who have much, you know, greater privileges than other prisoners. So it's not necessarily consistent. And then the wardens and the guards. Um, so this is like a, a whole nother thing, right? Is that um, the guard staff, right? These are people that are regarded. They're uh, one of the prisoners on the show says that these are people who can't even get jobs anywhere else. That's why they're jail guards, because this is like a terrible low paid job. Um, Lohman largely gives control over that aspect, the security aspect of the jail to a guy named Jack Johnson, who was an ex Chicago cop. Um, Lohman loved cops <laughs> um, and uh, kind of let Jack Johnson handle it. There are some directives in Lohman's papers about like, for example, banning brass knuckles, mm -hmm. uh, which is like, oh, that's not something that we're seeing get reported in the press, but clearly here is a, a, a really violent space um, that we're not seeing kind of manifest in other places. Um, so he, you know, rehabilitation is in some ways trying to clean up the reputation of the jail, even as violence is continuing to happen. And I, I love what you, you know, the point you make about the kind of tension between um, visibility and obscurity uh, within the jail. I think the kind of like the masks um, and the kind of orientation toward prisoner anonymity would have been Lohman's um, kind of decision. Um, but the first time I saw Community of the Condemned, I was at the Mo Moving Image Archive uh, at Indiana and it just blew my mind. I was not expecting them to be wearing masks. So yeah, I really appreciate those questions. Excellent. Um, Melanie, those are great. And um, I, in the interest of time, we have questions rolling in. So I want to make sure we get to as many of them as possible. So I'm going to give you a, a couple at a time if that's, um, I think that's okay. So the first question is from Matthew Grigula. How would you characterize the relationship between higher education and the carceral state? What role do universities play in the intellectual history of mass criminalization and incarceration? And then we'll also go with um, one from Sarah Winter. She says, Melanie, this is a fascinating project with so many resonances to my own research. Could you describe for us the contemporary abolitionist movement around mass incarceration of Black Americans that you mentioned in passing at the opening of your talk. 
how does this movement reorient or contest historical abolitionist movements and rhetoric? Yeah, oh, those are great questions. Um, so yeah, you know, in this, within the intellectual history um, specific to Cook County Jail, the Chicago School um, is deeply important to this history, um, at least for the, you know, kind of up through the 1960s. Um, and so, for example, in the progressive era, um, we see Chicago school sociologists and social workers really involved in knowledge formation around the jail and trying to scientifically direct um, jail policy. Um, you know, later we'll see um, jails kind of become almost like anti-intellectual spaces or the kind of the orientation um, toward jail administrators is not necessarily so um, collegiate as it is for this little bit in the 1950s. Um, you know, more broadly, um, I think we have to interrogate uh, how intellectuals um, have lent legitimacy to the carceral project because their role is absolutely it's very significant. The contemporary abolitionist movement should be the source of its own talk. You know, this is a movement that it's impossible to, to not be in contact with um, if you're doing work on Chicago. It, it's growing out of what people know from their own lives um, and having family members and neighbors um, incarcerated. I think if we, you know, to describe the abolitionist movement, it's, you know, the most kind of con condensed version is to imagine a world without prisons, right? To imagine a world where uh, prisons become unnecessary uh, because communities are doing a better job of caring for each other. This movement, I think it, as far as it reorients or contests historical abolitionist movements, I will actually mention an abolitionist movement that you probably don't know about, which was the movement for jail abolition um, in the early 20th century. Um, and they were for, you know, not abolition in the sense of like abolishing slavery, but abolishing the local jail and turning jails over to states, which is actually what happens eventually in Connecticut. You know, contemporary abolitionism, I think, is is speaking to that deeper history, but I think we can, you know, engage kind of other abolitionisms along the way. So yes, that is a huge question. But I will say that, you know, as far as it's shaped my own work, I keep having to rewrite my conclusion because abolitionists are changing policy and changing institutions um, on seemingly like a month by month basis. They're accomplishing something new in Chicago uh, and Illinois. So uh, this is very much on my mind. Excellent. So we'll take a couple more. One from Amy Loisel. Thank you for a vital and illuminating talk. I'm curious about the developing relationship between prisoner rehabilitation, prisoners who want job training or prep for post-incarceration, and the use of prisoners for coercive labor. Were job training and quote, paid work part of the context here? And a second question from Sarah Silverstein that I think relates nicely to this. Thank you for your fascinating talk. Have you been able to follow any of the prisoners after their release? Did any of those who became involved in prisoner advocacy continue in activism later, either on the subject of prison reform or in other areas? As far as I know, people were not being paid in their work for the jail. Jill, um, there was a very extensive work program at the House of Correction. Um, they had a House of Correction farm out in the suburbs. Um, at one time, they had like a quarry, a brick making operation, shoe repair, carpentry, um, because the original intent of that institution was for it to be self-sustaining. Uh, when it opened in the 19th century. Job training was um, a bit of the project in Cook County Jail, although there really wasn't part of this space. Um, but there is a kind of larger discussion happening about the fact that they can't, people are having a really hard time getting work and keeping work after they're let out of jail. And so um, several of the prisoners who appear on Community of the Condemned talk about how they would be in a job for a week and somebody would notice them from jail and then they would get fired 
because they hadn't told the employer about their record because they wouldn't be able to get a job. So there's kind of um, a sense that like you're damned if you do or you're damned if you don't. Um, and the, they complained about the kind of training that they got through uh, prison work programs, right? You would learn how to repair shoes, but they were outdated methods that nobody used anymore. So uh, prisoners were certainly frustrated, I think, with their relationship to work. Um, although there are definitely notes in the grapevine from younger prisoners who weren't being allowed to work and they were frustrated because they were so bored. Um, and then to the next question, uh, I have not been able to follow prisoners um, in, in this section after their release. Um, there are some that we are able to see that come up later, uh, people who are politically imprisoned like Dick Gregory for civil rights issues he's kind of in and out of the jail. So I'm thinking about him as someone who's kind of um, sh moving over the boundaries of the jail. Um, you know, similarly, Harold Washington, who becomes mayor of Chicago, uh, he served 40 days in the jail in the 1970s for tax evasion. Um, so we do see people who are formerly incarcerated, um, you know, including Hans Matic, uh, really becoming a part of not just the politics around the jail, but really central to politics um, in Chicago. So I would say, you know, ultimately, yes, absolutely, but not necessarily people who are, you know, kind of um, doing these more small scale kind of things. Okay, another question. Um, this one's from Catherine Jewell. I'm wondering about the different functions of print versus broadcasting in these spaces. One goes out and disappears, except for the recordings, and are consumed by in the immediate, but the others remain and can be continually disseminated and passed around. Do differences in consumption, dissemination affect their content? And another question from David Samuels um, is, thank you for this great presentation and a fascinating project. I wonder if you can talk a little more about the role that music and broadcasting played in the history that you're investigating. Note, noting that B.B. King famously played at the Cook County Jail in 1971, and wondering if there are any links to be explored there. Yeah, I mean, this, these are such cool questions. Um, so I think the question of consumption and dissemination is really fascinating. The prisoners, they, for a while, the, the grapevine is being covered in the Chicago Tribune. Um, and the Chicago Tribune starts making fun of them because they're like, prisoners are lifting poems by famous people and not, and attributing them to themselves. Um, and so, and the Tribune starts making fun of them. Uh, so you see a little bit less of the kind of freedom of it, I think, once they get that kind of press attention. I am curious about the relationship be kind of, between kind of the dissemination of um, community of the condemned right, prisoners like had their chance to speak to a national audience, right? And so there are some times when they're not answering the question Loman asks, because you can tell they're like, oh my God, I get to finally say my piece. Um, you know, I wish we had recordings of, of the jail radio station because I would just be so curious to know um, because that was being piped through the whole jail. It was inescapable um, and it was, it was a pretty huge event and that's not something that's really done in other jails today. You know, the role that music and broadcasting played, um, this plays out a couple of different ways. Uh, so one example is that the jail radio station, um, they publish the playlists in the grapevine. Um, they make kind of a big theatrical stink about like, we don't play rock and roll here. Um, they are not into it. They get visited by celebrities who show up um, on the jail radio station. So Tom Yen Lo Wong gets to meet Sammy Davis Jr. when he comes to the jail. Um, so there are these kind of um, points of contact with music that they're making. Um, I do talk about B.B. King coming to the jail uh, in 1971. Uh, that was under uh, a guy named Winston Moore was the warden. He's regarded as the nation's first uh, black jail warden. And Moore um, 
he was really well connected in Chicago. He was also advertising in Billboard magazine for acts to come to the jail. Uh, and so uh, Dionne Warwick, Stevie Wonder, B.B. King, I mean, Aretha Franklin, some of the biggest acts of the day uh, performed at Cook County Jail. Um, and this was really, you know, I think more just loved <laughs> music, loved performance. Um, but also wanted to kind of use these concerts to portray, um, a, again, a kind of rehabilitative, humane jail at a time when there was an incredible amount of violence. Um, and one thing I love about the B.B. King recording um, is at the very beginning, when they announce, you know, or acknowledge Winston Moore and the sheriff, uh, the prisoners boo. You know, it, it's just a classic moment in terms of really knowing exactly the way things were in the jail. Okay, we have a couple more questions and um, one from Orlando Quadrado. And to follow kind of the question about abolitionist movements now, um, Orlando asked that he was thinking about black codes in the South after reconstruction and the role they played in the beginnings of mass incarceration. And he's asking if there is an equal equivalent to that now. And Dick Brown asks, what offenses would result in imprisonment at Cook County Jail? Yeah, so I, I mean, both of these kind of speak to the kind of question of criminalization. And this is something that's really fluid over the course of the history of the jail. So at this particular time, uh, people are mostly getting targeted for drug offenses. So either possessing drugs or selling drugs or kind of petty crimes um, are being held by the House of Correction. Juvenile delinquents, uh, a, a lot of them are getting arrested for burglary and robbery, like larceny is a major kind of driving force in these kind of situations. Uh, and it's important to know, you know, um, Loman's other TV show that's digitized, uh, Searchlights on Delinquency, he has like, young people, um, you know, teenagers appear on that show talking about kind of why they were committing crimes, right? And, and it's kind of framed as they're part of these like criminal communities, right? It's very Chicago school and thinking about these kind of self-contained perpetuating communities. Uh, but many of the young people who appear on that show are kind of indignant about, um, you know, efforts by the people hosting the show to try and frame them uh, as being criminals. You know, they're like, well, why are you cavorting with other delinquents? And they're like, I got kicked out of my house. My mom was an alcoholic. I was homeless. Uh, these are my friends. They helped me find somewhere to live. Um, and so there's this real kind of gulf, <laughs> I think, in um, kind of the scholarly recognition of um, why people are incarcerated versus the kind of very human reasons that somebody might commit, you know, larceny to get money to live. Um, so those are kind of the major forces then. Um, man, you know, what's equal to the Black Codes now? Um, that's a tough call. I think the bail reform movement is showing that you know, bail, um, right, having to pay a security for your release after incarceration um, is used essentially to ransom people in jail. And so uh, very recently, uh, there's been a huge success in Illinois uh, in eliminating cash bail. Um, and hopefully that will work to start to work to mitigate some of the issues with people not being able to get their freedom because they can't afford it. Um, so I would say that's a tremendously important piece of this puzzle. Uh, although similarly, right, mass surveillance through um, electronic monitoring and other kind of conditions on release before trial um, are, are a tremendous issue. Okay, we have another question from Clayton Howard. Your talk did such a nice job blurring the line between inside and outside of the institution. Did anyone who ran the jail, such as wardens, guards, staff, et cetera, ever end up in the jail as a prisoner? I'm just curious about whether or not anyone saw the Cook County Jail from more than one vantage point. Yeah, I, I think Hans Maddock was probably uh, incarcerated at Cook County Jail. I don't think he's 
I don't recall him being specific about where he had been incarcerated. Um, he didn't claim any kind of identity as being like, I'm formerly incarcerated. But I think, you know, he probably more than anyone could speak to that perspective. And certainly I think uh, tried to appreciate the humanity of people inside uh, in a really significant way. Um, I, you know, both Maddock and Loman had done so much community work, um, you know, working closely on the parole board to help prepare people's uh, files to come up for parole. I think they're very intimately connected with the kind of humane concerns. Um, but yeah, that would be the kind of the people that I think are most connected to that vantage point. So we have time for a few more questions. So if everyone wants a chance to type one into the Q&A box. And in the meantime, Melanie, I might um, ask, you know, Tom Luyen Wong was such a, just, just this amazing personality that you introduced us to. So are there other individuals you came across in reading the grapevine or watching the community that condemned that are gonna be kind of part of this chapter and something maybe you would elaborate on a little bit more for um, our listeners? Yeah, I mean, he's, he's really the kind of the main prisoner that I've been able to track. Um, you know, there are other people who um, will kind of show up as like, you know, being editor of the newspaper for a while. And then there's a story about them um, getting out. But I think Wong is really the one that is probably the most prominent. There is another prisoner who's at the jail during this time named Paul Crump, um, who comes up in my next chapter. Um, he writes a novel um, while he's in the jail. James Baldwin visits him and smuggles the manuscript to his friends who published at Johnson Publishing, the kind of major black publisher, um, and he gets this book published. So, you know, Paul Crump is kind of a, a unique literary figure who kind of takes this rehabilitative moment at the jail and makes it um, his own after Loman and Maddock have kind of moved on from the jail. Um, were there other ways through this media that um, different people who are incarcerated would be able to kind of exhibit their own identity or viewpoints um, other than letters to the editor? Or was that mainly the, the, the way that you get to see most of these personalities and voices? Oh my God, no. There's, there's some of it that is so insidery, I can barely make sense of it. So there's these sections called chit chat and chick chat um and they are they're just like very conversational they're funny people are writing poems in honor of their you know lover outside they're kind of sharing gossip that again it's like so um jargon i can't think of the other mm -hmm. word slang it's like really slang laden so it's hard to make sense of um but they're definitely like really eagerly participating in this kind of insider culture. And I mean, there are other ways people are communicating, um, right? You can communicate through the pipes, the way the toilets are connected. Mm -hmm. um, and so people will acknowledge like the little romances that are be being conducted as people can talk to each other, men and women. And so, yeah, there, there are lots of ways that you can see people kind of manifesting their their personalities again, which is like, feels very antithetical to jailing. And this is not something that continues. I know that they continued to publish the grapevine into the late 60s. I've found exactly one issue on eBay um, and it's it has none of this flavor. It's completely flat, boring, not connected to kind of any like culture inside. Um, none of the administrative critiques. I think by that point it was probably being censored. Um, so, you know, this is something that's very specific to this administration. And right, they're trying to create this kind of larger platform for um, a wholesale reform of jailing in Chicago by merging the city and county jail. Um, so this is kind of foundational to that. Excellent. So you have a couple more questions. One is from Ariel Lamb. She said, I'm curious about the urban jail versus the rural prison in terms of staff and labor force. Is there a notable difference? And if so, how does it impact jailed or imprisoned people? 
we have a question from Dan Royals. He says, have you come across any evidence of queer sexuality in the archive? And another from Sarah Winter says, could you tell us more about the evolution of prison reform in Chicago after the 1950s movement that you're focused on? You mentioned that there's pushback subsequently. Yeah, so I think I can kind of, I can tangle with all three of these. Um, so the question of the urban jail and, and rural prison is really fascinating, right? Because one of the major conversations about rural prisons has to do with the kind of like generally white staffs um, and uh, racism in those environments, right? So thinking of, of like Blood in the water, water by Heather Thompson, right? Focusing on the white guards of upstate New York as kind of one piece of the Attica Rebellion. Um, there is a notable, noticeable difference. Um, the House of Correction had been hiring uh, African American guard staff since the 1940s. The Loman also begins hiring black guard staff and makes actually several African Americans into administrators. So as both uh, head matron, uh, the kind of head of HR, John Stroder becomes a Cook County board president uh, in like the 1980s. So they're really committed to trying to diversify the staff to better reflect uh, who's in jail. But also these are sources of political jobs. And also these are um, not necessarily union jobs, but jobs that are that have good benefits. And so even though they're low paying, over time, particularly through the 1960s um, and into the 1980s, uh, there's going to be uh, kind of more labor organizing by the guards uh, to get better pay that's more on par with um, other kinds of law enforcement in the city. How does it impact jailed or imprisoned people? It, it gets messy. It gets really messy. Um, I would say that in the 1970s, having a mostly Black guard staff is used as basically like well, you shouldn't have a problem with the jail being 90% black because the guards are black and they can they can fight racism inside. They're going to treat the guys better. That's not really the case. You know, in the kind of the larger scope of jail reform in Chicago after the 1950s, um, there's a lot of focus on creating the Chicago House, uh, sorry, Department of Correction. Uh, as a way to kind of institutionalize the rehabilitative programs, even once uh, the proportion of sentenced people has kind of gone back to more normal levels. You know, once that's achieved, uh, I would say the kind of the trajectory of the jail really starts to kind of uh, fall into relationship with the kind of broader context of law and order politics. And so we see that as a kind of major justification for uh, jail expansion during the 1970s, the idea that, that prisoners need to be controlled. In the 80s, uh, the state's attorney, uh, Richard M. Daly, the son of Richard J. Daly, the mayor, uh, launches just a huge campaign to basically make it very difficult for people to get out of jail before trial. Um, and he builds his entire political career on that. And that's kind of in tandem with the rise of class action suits over jail conditions. So one of the kind of major transformations I'm talking about is how this becomes a kind of less locally governed and more subject to outside uh, institutional concerns. Uh, and then finally, uh, I have found pretty limited uh, evidence uh, of queer sexuality within Cook County Jail. There was a movement um, at one point in the 70s of trying to get women from a state prison to incarcerate them at the jail. And the women organized against it in part because they had heard that uh, they would be treated differently as lesbians. And so they were very afraid of the kind of homophobic world of Cook County Jail. So we have one from Drew Johnson. I'm curious about the use of language of rehabilitation that you discussed in the context of a jail prior to trial. Do you have any further thoughts about why that language gets used? Yeah, it's so messy. One of the things I really come to appreciate about urban jails is that communities want to uh, believe that jails are doing good. They don't want to believe that jails are perpetuating crime um, or you know, committing atrocities. Um, and so I think rehabilitation is a kind of shorthand 
for, for not doing that. Anything that's not that is rehabilitation. Um, but it does become really messy later on as you know, the proportion uh, at various points of pretrial prisoners goes up to 90% um, after they merge with the House of Correction. Uh, so, th you know, at that point, it's like, well, why are you trying to rehabilitate people who are innocent? That doesn't really make any sense. But that's still a big part of um, conditional releases in which people will go through rehabilitative programs in order to get out on bail. So that's a certainly a, a weird kind of language that um, is not always used in a precise way. And certainly the jail has never really had the kind of financial capacity to carry out a large scale therapeutic program. So I think we might have time for one last one, one or two last questions. We have from Kenneth Foote, what is your next project beyond this book? And we have from Maywand Akberzai, are there any recent improvements which have been made regarding inmate well-being at the Cook County prison? You know, bail reform in Cook County is huge. Uh, the courts have also been very active in holding Sheriff Tom Dart accountable for actually trying to um, encourage, sorry, uh, like to, to get him to actually protect people against COVID. So that I think those are two major successes. My next project, um, I'm hoping to look at um, the relationship between incarceration and uh, disaster. So, um, you know, in part because reading this book uh, and seeing how many environmental uh, kind of challenges happen on this one site, which was at one point largely an industrial site, uh, has really made me appreciate the kind of importance of that. Well, I think we have reached about the time that we have. So I'm going to just interject and say thank you uh, uh, to Melody for a great presentation. Thank you, Nicole. That was a really great interaction. And um, thank you. Thank you.